All buildings are predictions. All predictions are wrong. Almost no buildings adapt well. They're designed not to, constructed not to, budgeted and financed not to, maintained not to, regulated and taxed not to, even remodeled not to. But all buildings, except monuments, adapt anyway because the usages in and around them are changing constantly. In the 1960s, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic domes were a vision of the future that turned out to have no future at all. What happened? The domes were unable to adapt or grow, so they died. Architects perpetually in search of a radical new look should bear in mind the lesson of domes. It was a time when anything was possible. I mean, in the 60s, it was a, probably the only, it was a, maybe a brief interlude in human history when in this country, and especially in California, when you could afford to uh, indulge fantasies. And these guys that built this dome were, um, for some reason, they were, they would get stoned and, and uh, uh, go to the Who concerts. And something about the Who concerts, uh, I think one of them had a revelation uh, maybe on acid at a Who concert that it was, he was designated to build a, 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 a crystal dome in Bolinas, and so for some reason or other, that's what they did. But you know, uh, building is not really something that you uh, want to do when you're stoned. Um, because of the shape, it's hard to fit furniture in against a curved wall. It's hard to subdivide it. Uh, it's very difficult to add on to it. When you have a rectangular building, you've got a wall like this, and if you want to add on to it, you just put a roof off it and another wall. But with a dome, you've got all these different facets which you have to tie into. If you want to build a home and have it function and live in it, then you're not going to look to visions of the future as a basis for the shape of your building. And what you see here is a dome that, was, that didn't work out. And now it's sitting here neglected with its only occupant being a, a, a beautiful lemon tree. The opposite of a dome in every respect is the rectangular Victorian townhouse. Right angles, flat walls, and simple pitched roofs have made them easy to adapt and maintain, and hence long-lasting. Here in San Francisco, there are 17,000 of these Victorian houses. They are built before the turn of the century, narrow little lots. They've become famous as San Francisco's painted ladies. Well, the reason they survived so well and became so loved is because they adapt well. On each floor, there are three to six rooms, so the houses are easy to divide into two or three flats, one per floor. The rooms are modest in size and unspecified in function. Each is lit and ventilated with its own windows, each has access to the corridor, and each is capable of opening into adjoining rooms these houses offer boundless flexibility. Through the years, people have had to treat this as a rooming house during the war, and it was able to accommodate um, a lot more than one family. We suspect that the dining room, for instance, which is now a formal dining room with pocket doors, um, we think that that was probably a bedroom because we found plugs all along the wall as if there had been bed set up down there, which is quite bizarre for a dining room. But I think it worked during the war years when there were probably a lot of people living here. One of the bonuses of, of this house, considering that these are row houses, so you really, you don't have any side windows at all. Um, the fact that it's so open, the plan is so open, 
you really share, we have morning sun in the back and we have afternoon sun um, in the front, but because we have the doors, every, every room in the house shares the light, which is really nice. I like that a lot about this house. Well, living on a postcard has some drawbacks, but really the, the world passes by your front door. It's one of the most beautiful houses and one of the most beautiful cities in the world. The buildings that come to be loved are the ones that work well, that suit the people in them, that show their age and history. All it takes is keeping everything that works, most everything that is enjoyed, much of what doesn't get in the way, and letting the rest go, or helping it evolve towards something that does work. Now that goes best when the building is owned by at least some of the people in it and maintained by them, not by remote antagonists. What makes a building learn is physical involvement by the people inside. Everything here is uh, built to suit our uh, needs, to suit uh, the purpose for living here outside of Prague. And it's uh, a better feeling for us that we are living in uh, something which we made by ourselves. Here in the Czech Republic, there's a long tradition of people escaping mass city housing projects to build their own weekend houses in the countryside. During the communist period, building your own home was one of the rare freedoms offered to the majority of the Czech people. It's an opportunity they seized and treasured. They still do. If we use the architect's help or advice, maybe our chata will be much more modern, comfortable, and expensive, of course. But we made it uh, by ourselves, uh, with our feeling, with our, I can say it, with our heart. We are proud that we built uh, during uh, 10 years uh, something not only for us but for uh, our children too. You see in Czech we have uh, the special proverb that it's necessary to build a house, to have some child and to pick uh, some tree. And I can say that I fulfilled everything. It would be nice if developers and architects would build tiny starter homes that can be added on to later and don't cost a lot. It doesn't happen because the profit margin is too small for the architect and developers worry about encouraging grassroots autonomy and change. That's too bad, because a few experiments have shown there's great demand for small, adaptable houses. Grow Homes and Next Homes, designed by a team at the McGill School of Architecture in Montreal, are small, affordable houses that are easily modified. Unfinished basements and open plan spaces mean that people can customize their homes as needs arise and finances allow. Before I bought this house, I was living downtown, in the downtown area, in a small apartment, one bedroom apartment. It was just my wife and I. We came around this area and, and saw the lot, which is close to my work, and we, we more or less felt in love with the area, and also the concept. The key factor was the fact that we have many people who cannot access housing today. Homes have become very expensive. We wanted to design homes that can be afforded by many people. The other reason was the yeah. fact that we have many family types Go. for which the traditional homes that are offered today in the market do not respond. We therefore need to create and invent 
housing types that are easily adaptable, flexible, and most of all, affordable. Once you get comfortable with the idea that a building is never really finished, then it comes naturally to build for flexibility. For instance, in a new building, you can have some areas that are left half completed, the way attics used to be. This basement here wasn't built at all. It was just uh, on the concrete, so nothing was done. I have basically the same floor space that I have on the two other floors, and uh, I'm finishing more or less half of it as a home theater room. I guess one of the big advantages, the ceilings are high, so it allows me to really have a, a sense in the room that it's a big room. 5,000 homes have been built in Montreal since the idea was first introduced. When we came back to the homes three years later, to our surprise and joy, we found that 92% of all the buyers changed, modified, improved the homes by changing the second floor, partitioning it, finishing basement, and introducing other features that correspond to their needs. Most buildings that are designed by architects to look radical wind up pretty conservative as life levels them out. A better approach is to start conservative and sensible and then let the building gradually become radical by being responsive to its unique life. Free to fashion, a building can become honestly interesting in its own terms. The architect and writer Christopher Alexander believes that if you spend more on basic structure and less on glitzy finish, your building should be capable of lasting 300 years. That slight adjustment in the way you invest in the building gives an enormously higher long-term yield. His West Dean Visitor Center in Sussex looks as if it's been there for years and will be there for years. The flint and brick combination echoes the stonework of the cottage next door. Alexander's building was completed in 1995, the cottage in 1636. You know, I was at Cambridge as a student. I learned absolutely nothing about what it means to make a good building. And I, th I started thinking about traditional buildings and why they were comfortable. And the first thing I realized was that they were always very, very well adapted to ordinary things, to moisture, to the sunshine, to the rainfall, to people sitting around a stove, to, you know, you name it, whatever it was. I realized there were rules of thumb that were being used by people. These rules of thumb were very straightforward. This is how you build a roof. This is how you build a fireplace so that it doesn't smoke. Since those rules were essentially embedded in culture and were not changing very fast, it was possible for them gradually to get settled because people could see whether they were working out right. When, some, when, when a rule got improved slightly, then it got embedded in the culture. Alexander became a contractor so he could apply his evolutionary principles to construction as well as design. His buildings learn while they're being built. Ideas are tried and thrown away and refined right through the process of construction. It takes longer, but it's worth it. At this house he's building in Northern California, Alexander's construction manager, Randy Schmidt, works with the clients to make sure they get a house that works for them. So uh, if you could just walk around the room and think that somewhere at that end there has to be a way to the living room. And if you'd like, we can move if those. that's the case, we have a living room here. Living room there? Yeah. Why? And then, no, 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 I mean the dining, dining room. room. Dining room there. Yeah. And so do you, why don't you move some chairs around and sit there and see if it feels calm to be there. Let's see. Let's see. It's different when you have something in your mind, you think uh -huh. this will look good or that will look good. But when you put the cardboard in there, it looks different, very different. And even if the architect has drawn out a lovely floor plan, it's still only a floor plan. 
behind the blind. It's almost inconceivable to us to have a happy outcome where the architect, at least intellectually, is uh, in a more authoritarian position of, uh, of coming forth uh, with a design from his forehead and handing it down, uh, not to us, but to a contractor who then uh, uh, completes the project. And then we come in and we say, well, uh, well I don't like this. I don't, well, I don't like, like this that. window here. This doesn't fit. Or, uh, too late. Or it's too late. If a building is allowed to fail small, early, and often, and be corrected, the building as a whole can succeed long and large. To make a building really fit your life, you have to be there for the daily fine-tuning. Living at the construction site, for instance, is a time-honored vernacular practice. That kind of physical interaction with a building turns occupants into active learners and shapers, rather than passive victims. Rectangular buildings with pitched roofs are easy to maintain, easy to adapt, and inexpensive to build. Architects groan with boredom at the thought. That's tough. If you start boxy and simple, you can let complications develop with time in response to real use. Self-builders know this. I think um, one of the things we wanted to try and get out of building our own house um, compared to buying, a, say, a brand new house on a new new housing estate somewhere, well, well there's a number of things, really. First of all, is quality. We started off with an architect, mm. and he um, did some designs for us, and it really, we weren't very happy with it at all. Um, at one stage, we had to suggest to him where to put the layout of the rooms, etc. And like a lot of architects, he didn't listen to what we really wanted out of the house. And so after we'd done initial designs, we parted company. And more or less designed the rest of it ourselves. The external shape and design of the house is fairly conventional. And that's partly because of um, planning regulations. It has to blend in with the other houses down uh, around this neighborhood. Another one of our concerns was for long-term maintenance. Um, I mean, I'm particularly concerned that I don't have to keep on going up onto the roof uh, every three or four years to, uh, to do repair work. Um, so one of the things that we have tried to incorporate into not only the design but the kinds of materials that we've used are ones that are going to last and are relatively maintenance free. Building a house is one of the biggest projects that you can never do. and. It's certainly something that I'm glad that I've been through. Um, I think, unfortunately, some people then get a bug for it and may want to then go and build other houses, which uh, shows that they're obviously completely mad. But in the end, I think we're going to end up with, well, a house that we're going to really enjoy living in because we'll have put so much into it. There's a certain amount of pride in it as well, I think. There's a certain amount of um, uh, us embodied in the house, if you like. And, that, and that's very satisfying. In the 1930s, an architect named Walter Siegel pioneered a low-cost system of timber frame building. Anyone who could pick up a hammer could build their own home. These days, the Siegel method is still being used to make affordable, flexible houses people get to build a house that suits them rather than fitting into someone else's idea of social housing. This is my house and um, is, you know, I've put about 5,000 hours into this so far so I'm really pleased with uh, what's going to happen. And the great thing about this is just the, the open plan of the space and the fact that 
Um, going to have lots of light hair, both from the, from the side and coming in. And I'm going to have my own wooden floor, which I am going to lay. And it's going to have the grains. And I've been told exactly how to lay the floor. And that it's got to be like the light, because the light's coming in in the southern direction, all the wooden floor strips are going to be laid out here. And in fact, I'm getting a bit excited about it because I'm going to go and buy the floor today. With most um, social housing, people get, you know, the standard things. So they've got the standard white kitchen. But here, you can have an influence over the design. Because the beams hold all the weight, it then means you can put windows into the spaces. And so over there, I, I put my own window in. Me, a person who's never built before. Also, another thing about this is that I know during the winter, when I come during the winter, I, I'm going to put a, um, a wood-burning stove here and I'm going to be able to sit down, like, a bit like an old grandfather. I might have my nice rocking chair here, and just sit there, see the wood burning, and look at my lovely floor and be a very happy man. Fusion's Jamin is a black-led housing cooperative that was set up by a group of young people who were being made homeless. Through the Siegel Trust, they were able to exchange life in a high-rise council block for a share in a healthy community of detached houses with gardens. Why I chose to self-build was um, maybe it's part of my Nigerian heritage. But it was a really strong thing. My grandmother, she built her own house. My mother in Nigeria, she built her own house. And also there's a whole thing about a community. So I knew that, you know, I had the enthusiasm and I'd been trying to get these schemes going. And I wanted, but I wanted to do it with a group of people, particularly like knowing that having worked on council estates and seeing children being brought up on tower blocks, I don't think that's the right thing. You can't move everybody out. But giving people an opportunity and it's really important that they are contributing as well to a scheme. So that's why I wanted to get involved with it. The other thing was just to be able to um, really know that you can actually do things. I mean, we've chosen a simple method, but I, I, you know, I had a bit of a problem putting up uh, a couple of shelves before. I remember renting out one place and this shelf fell down after about eight months, you know, and that was like the first DIY I did. But with the right supervision, we've actually built excellent houses. And I mean, you can see them, they're actually great houses. Every time, like, friends have come up and seen it, they've always been shocked at the quality of their houses. We were the ones who built the walls and we made sure the houses were straight. So where there's been a few mistakes, you can be damn sure that if a self-builder is going to live in that house, they've made sure that, that, that the roof was sorted. So the houses are of high quality, you know, when they're finished. And it's a simple reason is because we're going to live there and we've been building it. So we're going to make sure it works. Self-builders know their buildings inside and out, literally. But even they can lose track of exactly what is where in the guts of a building. Anyone who buries services in walls should follow the practice of design builder John Abrams. So let's start by the front door, Tim. All right. Okay. Back shot. Photographing walls before they close makes later adjustment much easier. The photos reveal exactly where the services go and what the hidden structural elements are. This way, you won't pound a nail into a water pipe when all you want to do is add a shelf. We started this process years ago. What happens is we take those photographs, we put them in a book, that book stays with the house, presumably forever it becomes very useful to the carpenters and tradespeople who are finishing the house. But then it, it increases in value over time because as alterations are done, as people forget, as people move on, there's this document. It's like x-ray vision into the walls. To us, it's like a history of the house and really quite magical to be able to look back through and also, you know, reminiscent of all the stages you go through when you build a house. But it also is invaluable for servicemen. I mean, people who come here to work on the house and have to check a circuit or something or other exclaim, you know, fervently every time they're here, what an idea, what time you're saving. And I I'm sure it avoids a great deal of destruction and things when you have to go try and find studs and find circuit breakers and whatever, but, but really very magical to look at. Made us think that we hadn't taken enough pictures of our children while they were growing up. <laughs> <laughs>
Most architects and builders want nothing to do with the building or its inhabitants once the construction is done. Abrams sticks around and takes care of problems that show up after his building is completed. He develops a devoted clientele that way. This business has always been about people. We have devoted ourselves to forming very close alliances with our clients that go on over time. And um, that's what this whole thing's about. It's about people. We want to maintain our connection to the buildings themselves and see those buildings endure. It's one of the most important places that we learn from. We see what happens to our buildings. Many have no connection to their past buildings, so they don't learn from them. These are the best teachers we have, these buildings, how they work. Because he's such a friendly fellow, it becomes um, a trusted friendship. So if anything goes wrong, we can just say, John, we got a little problem. And out he sends someone to fix He it. always stands by what he, he's not building houses just for speculation. He's building houses to last for a really long time. I can't imagine being as happy with a house, but it's a lot of little things and a lot, it's a lot of very big things as well. The big is certainly the sense of place and the sense of rightness in terms of the land, I think, as much as anything. It's been six years now since we built the house. And every spring he'll say, do you want some of the crew over there to, you know, fix the shingles that have blown off in mm. the nor'easter in January or... Make a list of what you want done, I'll come by. So his investment in the house, it just sort of goes on. And you, it, it's really quite astounding. I've never heard of anything like it. There's a universal truth which is rarely acknowledged. Buildings keep on growing. All grow in size, some grow in refinement. For better or worse, all of them keep changing. Finally completing a new building seems like such a glorious culmination, but it's an illusion. A building is not something you finish. A building is something you start. Next week, we'll look at the all-powerful, harsh realities of real estate. Why do we live where we live? Is your house primarily a home or an asset? Should you try to get rich quick or get rich slow? Watch next week to find out.